good morning from our world headquarters in New York. I'm Manis Cranny. And from our studios in London, I'm Danny Berger. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. President Biden wraps up his trip to Tel Aviv, pledging 20 truckloads of aid to Gaza, as long as none is diverted to Hamas. This is the UK Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, touches down in Israel as part of a two-day regional trip. We're not going to be sending any humanitarian aid to Hamas if they're going to come be confiscated. That's the commitment that I've made. It's a tale of two earnings. Netflix gets a boost after reporting its best subscriber growth in years, while Tesla misses the street's estimates amid low expectations. And markets await Chair Powell's remarks as 10-year Treasury yields near 5%. Chinese investors offload the most U.S. securities in four years amid a weakening yuan. A very good morning to you. There is no proceed carefully. There's no waiting and seeing by the bond market. They're not hanging around. You're seeing yields rise this morning. We're going to kiss that 5%. There's one thing about markets. They like to test psychological benchmarks. Take the 10s to 5 and see what flies. Also, the biggest asset managers out there have been slashing their long positions. Net longs have dropped the most since 2016. So the bulls of the asset managers are simply not believing that these yields have topped out. Uh, you're looking at China selling the most amount of bonds uh, for five months in a row. We'll come back to that in a moment. Crude is down this morning. What you are seeing there is, of course, a, a ramp by 2% yesterday. But the news that the president, you've just seen him there now, has moved to remove some of the embargo from Venezuela. We'll add maybe 200,000 barrels a day uh, or a 25% kicker up in Venezuelan production. I thought we'd give you a little bit of gold. It's at an 11-week high. It is up 6% since the Hamas-Israel attack. Manis, the 5%, nearing 5%, you say we're going to kiss it. Stocks do not like this. I mean, you're not being paid to take risk right now. Your earnings yield on the S&P, 4.5%. I can go get 5.2% by buying the front end, an end of the curve. You're seeing then stocks crack for a second day under that pressure. We were down more than one and a third percent yesterday. S&P futures off by a third percent. Same goes for Nasdaq. The elation of Netflix strong earnings sending us up nearly 14% in the pre-market. We're still weighed down by Tesla, though, down by about 5%. So it's that push and pull resulting in a negative index. European stocks also have earnings to contend with. Some poor earnings from the likes of Roche, Nokia, too. So those are down by nearly 1%. But, Manis, you mentioned that China flow out of bonds. I should mention, it's not just bonds. It is stocks, too. China sold a record amount of stocks, $5.1 billion in the month of August. That, again, is a record. So you see this overall picture of U.S assets man as i got the chart here in front of me lowest in four years well the velocity of that selling across the whole asset spectrum from china many would say is possibly to help them defend the yuan but it comes to those treasury markets that i said are, are, are they're not waiting around i mean there's there's just nobody waiting around in these bond markets there's no clearing price the 20-year auction uh, went quite nicely last night but if you look at what's happening from china in the bonds and that chart behind you for the fifth month in a row, they've been selling bonds. $16.4 billion is what mm. they sold in August. Danny, that's now the lowest holding of treasuries since 2009. De-dollarization, I think, could be the line uh, that, that other people will speculate. But let's yeah. reset. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is the latest world leader to arrive in Israel. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, is due to Egypt later today. The latest diplomatic effort comes as the U.S. President Biden signaled a full backing for Israel. If Hamas confiscates it or doesn't let it get through or just confiscates it, then it's going to end because we're not going to be sending any humanitarian aid to Hamas if they're going to come be confiscated. That's the commitment that I've made. And uh, so the bottom line is that uh, uh, LCC deserves some real credit because he was very accommodating. We're live to Tel Aviv with Oliver Crook. He is on the ground. Oliver, um, you know, that, that was Biden. They were delayed getting off the ground. Biden did a, a very impromptu uh, commentary with the press. What do you think he achieved in those seven and a half hours on the ground in Israel? 
Mattis, he came into an extremely difficult position, and then overnight before he arrived, that blast at the hospital made it all the more uh, complicated, which meant he also cut off the second leg of that journey, which was supposed to be in Jordan. So what did he achieve? He achieved to convey his message of political support for Israel, and again, teased a financial component to that that he's going to put to Congress, we understand, later this week. There is the second aspect of this, which is deterrence, and the U.S. position on this has been clear and has been succinct. It has been a one-word policy. It's don't. And it's one word that is backed by two aircraft carrier groups in the eastern Mediterranean and 2,000 U.S. soldiers on high alert. On the main question, though, in making progress on something meaningful like aid, we have heard positive noises from the Israelis, from Biden, from the Egyptians, but the aid is still not crossing the southern border of Gaza uh, from Rafa, in Egypt, into Gaza. That is still not moving today. And this is really demonstrates the limits that you have for a president who was only in Tel Aviv, was not able to go to Jordan to talk to Arab leaders. Well, on that point, Oliver, what did he have to offer the Palestinians and Arab leaders? Uh, and, and, and what more can we expect? So again, what was lacking on this was that other side of it, the diplomacy side of it, right? And that dialogue that he wanted to open with Arab leaders. What he did say in his speech, and it was interesting to listen to this, was he emphasized the point, which I think has been reiterated across the, the board, to Israel and to Israelis, that Palestinians are not Hamas. And he invoked 9-11. He talked about the rage that happened after 9-11 and how the United States sought to get justice after that, but that the U.S. made a number of mistakes. And he says that in going after Hamas and dismantling Hamas as is Israel's goal, they need to be very clear-eyed about what the objectives are, and they need to constantly reevaluate if the path that they're on is actually um, achieving those objectives. And he also mentioned at the end, in terms of durable solutions, a two-state solution. And in terms of the diplomatics of this, we are expecting there to be a summit in Egypt on uh, October 21st. That is this Saturday of Arab leaders. And there, mm -hmm. again, <clears throat> another point that he made was the normalization in the region from other leaders with Israel, which was basically broken asunder last Saturday in the attacks of Hamas. Oliver, thanks for keeping us up to date on all of this. That is Bloomberg's Oliver Crook. All right, let's get you to some of our other top stories this morning and see what's trending on the terminal. OpenAI, Manus, is said to be in talk to sell existing employee shares at an $86 billion valuation. At that valuation, the AI firm behind ChatGPT would become one of the world's most valuable closely held companies behind Elon Musk's SpaceX, TikTok, parent ByteDance. The U.S. Congressional Committee is targeting Sequoia Capital after starting investigations into several other venture capital firms for their investment in Chinese technology companies. And meanwhile, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Co., the full name, projected revenue ahead of estimates and predicted the worst could soon be over for the chip industry. It bolsters a growing view that tech demand could recover from its post-COVID funk going into 2024. Look, there is a whole lot of tech news to cover ground on. So you have those. And then we also had Netflix earnings yesterday. It's raising prices for some customers after posting its best quarter for subscriber growth in years. It's a sign of management's confidence in the future, even as rival streaming services lose money. Joining us is Bloomberg's Alex Webb. Alex I gotta be honest, I admitted on the show yesterday that I'm a password share. Manus shares his, I take my parents, to which my husband yelled at me saying that Netflix is now gonna come after us after that. Um, <laughs> what did we learn? How many people don't do the thing anymore that I do and now have their own Netflix? Well, the numbers have been pretty good on that front. Netflix has been cracking down on it. They have shown positive um, momentum in that sense. I don't know. Uh, whether, you know, Reed Hastings watches the show. Presumably he does. It's pretty early on the West Coast. Fair enough. He um, should if he doesn't. Yeah, maybe he can watch it on catch up. Um, <laughs> Yeah, look, that has been something that has given the momentum and it's given um, investors optimism that they'll be able to do it. The thing that is really interesting, though, if you look at the way they manage their growth, right, you can either add more subscribers or you can increase prices. They are growing subscribers again, which is good news. The uh, market, they outperform the number of subscribers they were expecting to add in, in uh, this past quarter. The coming quarter, they're expected to add another 8 million. That's what investors expect. The overall subscriber base is in the order of 250 million. So if you're increasing prices by $2 in your key markets, mm -hmm. such as the UK, such as the US, such as France, it's a little bit of maths there, but actually that's about 
10% to 20%, depending on which price point you're looking at, increase, they are not adding 10 to 20% more subscribers in those markets. Mm. You can see why they're actually leaning more towards price increases than they are towards subscriber increases, because that's where the greater opportunity lies right now. So just two things on loyalty, Alex and Danny. One, Danny, when they come knocking on the door and they say, come and bail Danny out, I won't be there. <laughs> and two, I'll just stand behind you while they take you away for code share. Or, or, sorry, for, pass, for password sharing. It's called loyalty. And, and put yourself first. But Danny, it, I've got your back. I've got your back, Danny. At, at, least, matters, <laughs> at least Alex has my back. Oh, man, it's leaving me out to dry. It's fine. I'm just it's honest. Fine. I'm just honest. I, the, you know, the other thing is this. By the way, it just shows you how immune we are to these kind of products. You know, you take it from me for, for $2 up to $3. Do you look at your bank statement? It shows you the command they have over pricing so they're ramping up the prices but then if i swing to the other side you got tesla and here's the thing it looks as if uh, you know he was full of doom and gloom on the on on this news call um but the numbers and the rhetoric are, are slightly disconnected in a way well, no, I mean, the numbers have been a little bit disappointing. They didn't meet, uh, they fell short of expectations. I, th I don't think expectations are as high as they have been in the past because, of course, we know that car sales are impacted by interest rates. Loads of people buy their cars using financing. So if that financing is getting more expensive, it becomes harder to buy a car. And particularly when you look at what's happening with Tesla right now, namely that they have massively expanded production capacity with new facilities in China, Germany and Texas. Uh, they have not yet filled all of that capacity, so they've been having to discount quite substantially. We've therefore seen a, a meaningful erosion of the gross margin. That has also come down below what uh, analysts were expecting. And then the mood music coming out of Elon mm. Musk itself it isn't too cheery. So it doesn't sound great for, for Tesla investors. Nonetheless, stock's down 5% in the, in the pre-market. Could be a lot worse. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the challenge is what happens in the months to come. Yeah, and, and Alex, just, just quickly before we let you go, we also had... Disney putting out some of their ESPN profit. Is this basically just to show it off? I mean, I don't know if show it off is the right word because it wasn't the best, but to get someone to buy this thing? Well, yeah, polishing it up and saying, hey, look at this cool new thing we have in our window. Not new thing, old right. thing we have in our window. Look, for a long time, there was an expectation that Disney would never sell ESPN because it's so cash generative, even if it's a declining business. Sometimes, though, a declining business that is still throwing off a lot of cash can be appealing to people, not least perhaps private equity mm. firms. They've, they've talked about strategic um, uh, partners, you know, they are putting it in the shop window. It has a very healthy um, level of profitability, decline of about 1% in, in revenue okay. in the most recent quarter. So not brilliant news, but it's polished up for a perspective buyer. Oh, Alex, you held yourself back there. Polishing up is, is a frame that's colloquially <laughs> used for a number of things that you want to put on offer uh, to yes. a market. But I'll leave you with that thought because we'll see you a little bit later on. That's Alex Webb uh, covering all things <laughs> tech. Uh, we have a Bloomberg poll, which is certainly worth, worth mentioning, Danny. This is uh, Bloomberg News and Morning Consult. This is in their swing state poll. And what we've got is Trump leads Biden 47 to 43% in the swing state poll poll. Um, the reason or one of the underlying uh, issues for voters, Danny, in seven states is trusting Trump more on the economy is what the poll shows perhaps over Bidenomics. We'll return to that, uh, perhaps in touch on that with our guests uh, coming up on the show because we're going to talk about the dollar. The Yankee, Sonia Martin, head of FX and monetary policy at DZ Bank, joins Danny and I next. And we speak to Tom Narayan, IRBC Capital Markets, to discuss Tesla earnings right here on Bloomberg. I'll be looking carefully at the data to see whether the real side of the economy begins to cool off or whether prices, the nominal side of the economy, heat up. As of today, it is too soon to tell. Consequently, I believe we can wait, watch, and see how the economy evolves before making definitive moves on the path of the policy rate. That was the Federal Reserve Governor Christopher Waller there on wait and see mode. Sonia Martin is the head of FX and monetary policy and research for DZ Bank. Um, the dollar is not exactly, I mean, if I look at the markets this morning, yields are not in a wait and see mode. They're not hanging around. The dollar 
still remains for many king dollar. In that wait and see rhetoric, does the dollar prevaricate or move higher? Good morning, Sonia. Good morning. Yeah, it, and it is interesting to see how bullish people have become on the dollar. If you look at recent commentaries, we've seen first parity, your dollar parity calls out there. And when you look at the broader picture, you see that the dollar has performed really very much across the board. So it's not just against, you know, an economically vulnerable euro. It's really a broad dollar strength. Um, I think it mainly has to do with the, uh, with the whole U.S. economic optimism. I actually don't think it's that much of a safe haven argument at this point. I think mainly the dollar really benefits from the view increasingly widely held mm -hmm. that the U.S. is going to do uh, not even a landing. It's just going to continue to fly. Sonia, when we've had people come on the program with Manus and me, one of the arguments for not long dollar is just positioning, that we've built up this really heavy long dollar positioning. Should we care about that in these types of moments of economic growth and geopolitical strife? Well, when you look at euro dollar in particular, for example, you see that we had quite a large overhang actually of long euro dollar positions that has been unwound. So I, th I do think positioning does matter. Uh, when the market is fully positioned, uh, there is probably not that much more benefit to be had in there. And I think in many ways that is true here. You know, people have become really optimistic on the US uh, and I think they're ignoring the warning signs. I mean, I know I keep repeating this mantra, but it's true that I think the U.S. economy faces some massive challenges. Maybe just at the time when people are sort of throwing the towel on the U.S. slowdown story, it might just happen. I mean, you know, auto credits, 8%. You will look at e, uh, rates on mortgages. They're sky high. I mean, this is bound to hurt. And I think this is where the big surprise is going to come from. And I think probably, you know, in a few weeks' time or a few months' time, we're going to have a very different story that we are telling. It's interesting in that Elon Musk talked about the PTSD that he had from 2009 and he talked about mm. high rates and people not being able to afford to buy new cars that's the reality of 8% people aren't moving flats yeah. but uh, they're not moving flats they're not moving houses but here we are rates and growth at the moment are underpinning the dollar but then let's flip it over you say it's going to pivot is that what saves the euro it's it, it, it's it's a <laughs> drop in the dollar rather than an assurity in the euro that saves us from a demise below yeah. parity. I don't think the euro is going to save itself. I, I agree with you on that. I mean, the situation in Europe is pretty dire. Uh, it will improve, but it's not going to be some sort of miraculous recovery. Uh, so it's going to be some moderate growth, a bit of an improvement from where we are today, but not massive. And I think it's the dollar side, which is going to be the driver of that move, because I think that, again, the discussion is going to change. You know, it's interesting how people are so focused on the Fed, you know, higher for longer. Uh, we're not really talking about the Fed cuts that are going to come next year anymore. But that discussion is going to change. And, you know, we say, just remember that in the spring of this year, everyone was totally convinced that the Fed would be cutting aggressively this autumn right now. Mm. So, I mean, we have seen some massive volatility, not just in the market, but also in the way that, you know, people predict where things are going to go. Yeah. It's been, a, what, three years of, of narratives constantly challenged. Sonia, one yeah. of the narratives had been an S&B that was on hold. It unexpectedly left policy rates unchanged. Again, back to the positioning question. We had this huge buildup of shorts. How much of the rally in the Swiss franc, based on its haven status, again, is just that, is pressure from the shorts meeting haven versus some sort of sustainable strength coming from the Swiss franc? I think it has been a combination of these factors, as you just mentioned, positioning, some safe haven. Um, but I mean, when you look at the broader picture and you look at what's happening elsewhere, I mean, I don't necessarily feel that we had a massive safe haven flow at this point. I think, you know, it always sounds a bit awful to say this, but the reality is that as far as financial markets are concerned, the situation in the Middle East right now is a ma major risk, but it's very much a risk. I think people aren't, you know, necessarily pricing in a massive impact on the global economy or in inflation. And that would change, obviously, the minute we get a sort of more persistent rise in the oil price and if the, the, mm. the conflict widens and other countries get involved. And then we're going to see a massive safe haven right. if this happens. But I think right now we're not there yet. Okay. Sonia, really great to talk with you this morning. Sonia Martin of DZ Bank. Now, quick check on those currencies as we head to the break. King Dollar, he is still there, up a tenth of 1%. But you just heard from Sonia, warning of potential growth headwinds to come. Sterling under pressure this morning, facing a big options pressure 
after we had that stronger inflation report earlier in the week. Dollar yen just under 150. This is Bloomberg. It's been a brief. I'm Anna Kenny in New York, Danny Berger in London. The bond markets are definitely in a touchy mood, Danny. Right the way across, five bits higher uh, for the U.S. The Chinese are selling bonds like Bilio down for the fifth month in a row. They've been selling bonds. 16 billion is what they sold in August. There is no patience. There is no proceeding carefully in this bond market. UK gilts also pop a little bit higher by uh, four bips. And the Aussies, uh, well, of course, they're not to be outdone. Actually, the Kiwis, Danny, let me just put this to you. Apparently, it was technical difficulties. They had to cancel the auction. So these bond markets, they are not in a wait-and-see mood, are they? Good morning. Good morning, Manis. And I can't help but think... If yields are going to continue to trot higher, how can equities stay afloat during this? I said this stat at the top of the show. Earnings yield on equities, 4.7%. Front end of the curve, we've been talking about it, 52 Everybody wants to flow into cash. You can see why, as uh, author says, there is a Tina. There is an alternative now. Don't forget, there's unspent money in the pockets of uh, the stimulus checks. I think City have a number right yeah. there. There's still a trillion dollars. Look, coming up, we're going to talk about the big beast of EV, Tesla, with RBC Capital Markets on Bloomberg. Good morning. Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manus Granny in New York. And I'm Danny Berger in London. Here's what you need to know. President Biden wraps up his trip to Tel Aviv, pledging 20 truckloads of aid to Gaza, as long as none of it is diverted to Hamas. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak touches down in Israel as part of a two-day trip. It's a tale of two earnings. Netflix gets a boost after reporting its best subscriber gain in years. Tesla misses street estimates amid low expectations. And markets await Chair Powell's remarks as 20 year, 10 year rather, treasury years near 5%. Chinese investors, they offload the most U.S. securities in five, four years amid weakening yuan. I can't get my numbers straight, but this is one number I do have in my mind, man, is $5 billion. That's how much Chinese uh, investors, the Chinese government rather, sold of U.S. stocks. That is the most on record. It's not just that weighing on equities. It's higher yields and it's weak earnings from the like of Tesla and European companies like Roche. So both S&P and NASDAQ futures are down at least a quarter of a percent for the S&P. Pre-market, Tesla is down some 5%, Netflix up some 14%, while European equities manage. Again, I mentioned the weak earnings there. Those are down by about eight-tenths of 1%. Well, Danny, the clock will strike 12 in New York, and we will hear what Powell has got to say. But these bond markets are not hanging around. They are not in wait-and-see mode. They're not in the mood to proceed with caution. Yields rise this morning uh, on the 10-year paper. That is up for the fourth day in a row. And the hurdle, we are trying to find a clearing rate in these bond markets about where the asset managers will step in and buy them. They are cutting. They've slashed their long positions but to the lowest level uh, over the past couple of months. So the asset managers are not in there. They are not convinced it's time to go long duration. The Chinese are selling for the fifth month in a row and they're holding up bonds is at the lowest since 2009. Crude is down because Joe Biden not just engineering aid to Gaza but also stepping back on the restrictions with Venezuela. It looks like uh, some of those uh, embargoes, sorry, some of those uh, sanctions will be eased. You can see 200,000 barrels of extra oil coming out, 25% uplift from Venezuela. That's what's taking your oil market the heat out of the oil market ever so slightly this morning. But if you are looking for a hedge, whether it's Swiss franc or whether it's yen, but also you've got gold at an 11-week high. It's now up 6% since we saw the very start of the Hamas-Israel conflict. Danny, good morning. Good morning, Manis. And amid all of that, there has been a dollar bid, but it was interesting listening to Sonia Martin over at DZ Bank basically saying, look, it's, it's not really the haven, it's the strong U.S. economic data. And on that point, she's not convinced it will hang around. No, she's not at all convinced on that. She said, you know, it's ironic how sort of six months ago it was the death of the dollar was called. We're far from that. We're up 6% since the start of the summer. Uh, and what you've got here it is a furious vortex higher in yields. And growth is the underpinning of that dollar bid. Danny. 
Yep. All right. Well, let's move to tech because yeah. the startup Manus behind ChatGPT, OpenAI, it's in talks to sell existing employee shares at an $86 billion valuation. That is a nice chunk of change. And it's according to people familiar with the matter. For more, Bloomberg's Alex Webb joins us. Alex, I know there have been rumblings of this. We had a range before, but $86 billion, I mean, that is a hefty valuation for OpenAI. Yeah, particularly given what we know about the earnings, which are that it has sort of, or in August at least, a trailing 12 month, or is on track to generate a billion dollars in annual revenue. So it's trading not trading, but it'd be valued right. at 86 times its historic revenue, which is meaningful even for hyper-growth tech companies. And in terms of the investigation, Alex, we understand that the U.S. are investigating Sequoia and what their involvement with China is. What can you tell us about that story? Yeah, so it's a congressional committee which is uh, asking questions of Sequoia Capital. It's one of the, you know, most storied uh, venture capital firms in Silicon Valley. Valley has backed some of the biggest tech companies that we know today, going back best part of 50 years. It is breaking its business up into three parts, the US part, the China part, and the uh, India, Eastern, Asian di division. Uh, the thing that's really at the focus of the committee's attention is this China business, how it's directing capital into China, also what sort of expertise it might be lending these Chinese companies. Is it uh, affecting some sort of knowledge transfer into China? There's a huge amount of attention on this issue as a whole. Of course, Sequoia Capital will deny that this is the case, um, but that is what is the focus of this congressional questioning. Just to put a bow on all this and other Asia tech, we had TSMC earnings, so they cut their full year capex, they miss estimates but also see healthier growth in 2024. What does this market care most about? It, it, as ever, it's the forecast. It's the outlook. There's been a huge amount of skittishness in the semiconductor industry. We saw ASML, which is usually the, the leading bellwether on semiconductor demand because, of course, they make the machines that make the semiconductors that will be in the market in two, maybe even three years' time. They've seen a massive slowdown of orders everywhere apart from, of course, China. Right. Um, TSMC is their biggest customer. They are saying that there will be a rebound in chip demand. They're hopeful for a rebound in chip demand in 2024. Maybe they kind of have to say that. But equally, the numbers did beat expectations. So there is a glimmer of hope um, in what has recently been a slightly um, maligned chip mm. industry. Well, certainly it, it, it's been a tough run and as, as people debate where the world goes for 2024, uh, along with rates is the big challenge to a lot of the growth stocks. Alex, thank you very much. Alex Webb there uh, with the very latest on all things tech. Let's focus in a little bit more on Tesla. Disappointing in terms of the numbers. We brought you that earlier. It was a miss on profit and sales. The CEO, Elon Musk, dialing back the expectations as years of rapid expansion collide with this rising interest rate market. I apologize if I'm, if I'm perhaps more paranoid than I should be, because that might also be the case, because I, I am I have PTSD from 2009, big time. And he's not the only one with PTSD from 2009. Many people have it. Um, GM and Chrysler went bust. Remember that? Uh, Tom Narian is RBC lead for Global Autos. He has an outperform rating on the stock. You're ever bullish, 305 bucks. Good morning. It was a miss on the numbers and a miss on sentiment. I would say it was a trifecta of doom from Tesla. Tell me the other side of the trade. Yeah, certainly I think people were expecting them, I think, to miss. Uh, they had some production cuts for upgrades. Um, but I think what the, what the investor base is really missing is this is actually a part of a giant pivot uh, towards become a supplier uh, to other OEMs and eventually licensing FSD. You know, initially they said they were going to have all these volumes, you know, selling 20 million cars, you know, these sorts of things. I think we're noticing the company changing the narrative towards maybe not making as many cars, but now pivoting towards selling, charging infrastructure, power electronics, batteries, and then, yes, FSD and autonomy. That's the real moneymaker anyway. We think investors are kind of missing mm. the forest for the trees here. That, that, I mean, that's really interesting, Tom, because, you know, even here in the UK, if I do a road trip with an electric car, the supercharging stations are so much more efficient. And then you have the other ones where you have these long, long lines. So it's clear that there is demand for that kind of thing. But then what does Tesla look like? Take me 10 years down the road for this company. 
Are we talking about a, a completely different beast? I think so. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. You you posited the Netflix example before how it's creating today. If you remember, Netflix in 2011 to uh, 2013 went through a very difficult transition and shifting from DVD uh, rentals towards streaming. And it was a painful, but then it wound up being wildly successful. I think something similar is afoot here with Tesla from selling cars to now becoming a supplier to OEMs, which honestly is far more profitable. We just saw BMW announce yesterday they're joining Tesla's supercharger network in North America. They said previously they'd never do this. Tesla's really starting to become the place where OEMs have to go to for all of these things, batteries, power electronics, charging, and then we think ultimately FSD. What would that do to valuation? I'm looking back here on a five-year chart. $412 is where it is. Why not say to the market, actually, I'm going to carve out this auto production unit uh, and I, I'm going to have a tech manu I am a tech manufacturing supply chain company. With that, that hives off what is a car company and gives you a tech company. Does that re-engineer the value quicker to $305? Would his ego let him do that? That's the question that goes in the back of my mind. Yeah. Well, you kind of need the cars as a proof of concept, right, to see FSD, to see the technology firsthand. So it's really a proof of concept today. But if you look at my 305 price target, you know, only 10% of that is cars, actually. Um, I have, uh, you know, 70% of it is robo-taxi and 20% of it is just FSD itself. So this is a completely different future for this company. You need the car as the proof of concept. As far as separating these businesses out, maybe that happens in the future. But really what they need to do is show that take rate of FSD, how profitable it could be. And then in the future, the robo-taxi promise. That's ultimately what he talked a lot about in the call last night. And I think that's really ultimately going to solve this whole jigsaw puzzle. Well, just hold that thought, because your valuation is 10% cost. I've got to ask Danny Berger, would you get into a robo-taxi? Which city have you been in that you get into a robo-taxi? Because I tell you what, I've just come from Dubai. I wouldn't get into a robo-taxi in Dubai. Would you get into a robo-taxi, Danny Berger? <laughs> I, I would go into a robo-taxi if it's one of those things that people talked about. Like, you go in, and it's a spa. There's a masseuse there or a gym or something like that. <laughs> one of those. One of those I would certainly do. Tom, I mean, come on. Is that the future that we're talking yes. about? Am I going to be able to, you know, get my hair done on my oh. way to work? <laughs> well, I don't have hair done, but you'll definitely be a, a living room, an office, <laughs> entertainment, a bedroom. You, Just do you know what you're saying? Do you know what you're saying? No, no, no. Do you know what you're selling? You're selling that <laughs> advert for the A380 that they put out before Emirates bought them. And, 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 and there was going to be swimming pools in the sky. I mean, Emirates <laughs> business class is lovely. But can I ask you, the one thing that I was fascinated about is the robot. I'm going to need one of these in later life. Now, I think this is the thing. It's going to be able to do yoga, apparently, next year, the robot. What portion of robotics, on a slightly more serious valuation note, will robotics play in this company? I mean, today, I, I'm not giving any credit for it right now. I think that's a call option to the future. Um, I think it's an Elon project currently, but Elon projects in the past have wound up being wildly profitable. So <laughs> today, I don't include it in my valuation, but don't underestimate the robo-taxi thesis. That is a very real thing. It's 100% happening, I think. Um, it's it's, it's going to happen before you know it, too. I've just got to build yeah, my trust Yeah, I mean, it factor. seems... <laughs> so, Manus, would you take a yoga class from a robot if you won't get in the taxi? Listen, I'm struggling with Pilates and yoga as it stands, so don't be worrying <laughs> about the robots telling me how to, how to find my inner, my inner chi. <laughs> I love it. I mean, it doesn't seem relaxing at all, a bot telling me to uh, do downward dog. Anyway, Tom, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for joining RBC's Tom Naranian there. Thanks so much. All right, so we've covered some of the U.S. earnings. Want to quickly, Manus, whip through what we've seen in Europe. SAP, those shares up some 5%. They reported cloud revenue that grew 23% in the third quarter. Yep, no get 14,000 job cuts. Unfortunately, the cost of, of human capital is looking big there. It's going to try and shave 400 million bucks off expenses. Danny Nestle, Kit Kats did not deliver, did they? Mm-mm, 6% organic revenue growth. That is the weakest in almost three years. My favorite of this, Manus, is they did say they were looking at products that could complement Ozempic and the weight loss drugs. There you go, Winnie. That quick snapshot of Renault really taking a hit there, down 6%. Uh, sales come in slightly lighter than estimate, but a brutal attack on the stock. Good morning from New York and London.
No person having received a majority of the whole number of votes cast by surname, a speaker has not been elected. Pursuant to Clause 12A of Rule 1, the Chair declares the House in recess subject to the call of the Chair. That was the interim House Speaker, Patrick McHenry. Joining us now is Kate Ackley, Bloomberg Government. She's up early tracking Jim Jordan. I mean, the numbers are getting worse for this man rather than progressing for him. Um, is there a path to speakership for him? He hasn't given up yet. I think the big question for him today is, is he going to stay in this race? Is he going to drop out? That's, you know, I think that's the big question. Um, he, you know, the, the second ballot yesterday was worse than the first the day before. So it's not looking smooth for him. If not Jim Jordan, Kate, then who? That's a, another great <laughs> big question. The, <laughs> the person you just had on screen, Patrick McHenry, Congressman from North Carolina, he runs the Financial Services Committee. There are a lot of people from the House, the Senate, lobbyists, people in the banking industry who know him and like him. There are a lot of people sort of clamoring for him. I don't know if that's, uh, you know, a real thing that could happen, but there are other members, Republican members of Congress, who are sort of launching quiet bids people that aren't necessarily high profile, Mike Johnson, a Republican from Louisiana. There are other names, people who are sort of, uh, you know, mounting quiet campaigns. What's driving the whole lights? I mean, we, we've got a poll, I know, from this morning, which, which we've got, which we'll get to at the moment. But this is incredibly important. It maybe plays to some of the whole lights as well. They're in swing states, aren't they? That's right. There are the, the people who are hold out. Some of them are in battleground districts. Some of them are former veterans or veterans, you know, former military people. So they're worried about is the Defense Department funding at stake with a speaker, Jim Jordan. There are just a lot of things happening that are driving some of this. We've seen high level House appropriators uh, come out against Jim Jordan. Uh, again, worrying about government funding being mm. at stake. And, you know, talk about sort of high drama. Some of the lawmakers yesterday who voted against Jordan said that they have received credible threats from, you know, I, they didn't say who, but they said, you know, they're asking uh, the Capitol Police and et cetera to investigate. Mm. Um, Kate, uh, Manis mentioned this, a, a poll that came out of, of Trump leading Biden 47 percent to 43 percent in swing states. Can you, can you just break down these results quickly here and, and what it means going forward? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these are the key battleground states, not just in the presidential race, but also some of the, mm -hmm. the key Senate races. We're looking at Michigan, Arizona, Nevada, Wisconsin. You know, these are Georgia. These are gonna be key battleground states in House or Senate, and of course the presidential race um, you know, so there's a lot at stake. It's a long time away before uh, Election Day 2024. But I think you're going to see a lot of candidates, not just top of the ticket people, but down ballot okay. looking at these kind of results. And you mentioned the poll. There was another thing in terms of the war in Ukraine. Uh, in these battleground mm. states, voters said they trusted Trump more than Biden on that. And that could have repercussions mm. for a big funding package on Capitol Hill to help fund Ukraine. All right, Kate, thank you very much for that, for getting up early for us. Kate Ackley of Bloomberg Government. Coming up, a look at some of the market-moving events to watch throughout the day. But first, here's what is moving in markets. U.S. futures weaker, 43.36 on your S&P. Dollar strong, king dollar still apparent. Ten-year yields up by five basis points, nearing that 5%, while crude tumbles nearly 2%. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in London. Manish Cranny is in New York. Let's get you set up for your trading day with a look at what's ahead. We'll get U.S. initial jobless claims, 8.30 a.m. Eastern. That will be followed by existing home sales. Those hit at 10 a.m. Then it's a big day of Fed speak. We have Jefferson, Goolsby, Barr, Bostic, Harker, and Logan. They are all on deck. But of course, Manis, the main event is Chair Powell. He will be speaking at 12 p.m., followed by a fireside chat with Bloomberg's David Weston. So far, what we've heard over the past 24 hours from Fed speakers is the ability to be patient. Will we hear that same wait and see from Chair Powell? Well, that bond market is in no mood for patience, is it, Danny? It's careering, barreling towards 5% without pausing for breath. There is one CEO. He is the front cover of the big take, and it is, of course, a Amati. Uh, he took over... Uh, Credit Suisse. He's reasserted his position as the UBS CEO. It's the second coming, so to speak. And of course, it's a CEO in a hurry. That's a picture of him in Davos just a couple of years ago when he was stepping down his last interview. Uh, and then, of course, Tom Narajal, who was with us last week, who is the CFO, saying it's a Hollywood cast. This is the reincarnation <laughs> of UBS Credit Suisse. And I think, Danny, this is a CEO who knows how to de-risk a bank, change an investment bank, as they've got here in the US. It's different at home in Europe. But, of course, he's done this before. He has form, magnificent form. The stock is up a third since he sat in the hot seat again at UBS. Well, we know it's, what, like a matter of months until Netflix makes this into a movie a, a, of some sort. So, the Hollywood, you know, the Hollywood is, cast. Maybe, yeah, it is maybe quite literally a Hollywood cast. And, and look, it's, it's not just Armati, which, of course, this piece focuses on. It's also Chair Colm Kelleher, who has made it no secret that he thinks the company should be valued higher, maybe as high as Morgan Stanley, where he spent a good portion of his career. They want to move into the U.S. They want to move into U.S. wealth management. But, man, as we did get Morgan Stanley earnings yesterday, that part of the business didn't look so good. New assets were the lowest in more than three years for Morgan Stanley. No, but look, there's many Europeans and, 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 and Swiss have come here. I mean, Brady Dugan ran Credit Suisse for many years, the American who, who did more transatlantic mm. flights than most. UBS has 2,000 wealth advisors here. Morgan Stanley has 16,000. And the cost, one of the, one of the underlying issues here for UBS in the United States of America is the cost-to-income ratio is higher here than it is in Europe. But that burning ambition, which is to be the dominant force, Deutsche Bank tried, HSBC tried. I'm not saying they failed. That's for greater minds than I. But this is our motto, hmm. and the question is, does he come to New York on a charm offensive for the institutional shareholders? Is that what Colin Kelleher brings, the super source to UBS? That's part of the Hollywood cast, isn't it? Irish and Swiss. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, as part of this, as they push into the U.S., man, is I'm, I'm expecting you to, to tell me what's going on. I'm, I'm, you're you're going to take up that mantle. I hope you know. Um, look, in other earnings, yes. shall we touch on Netflix and Tesla quickly here? Because if you look at the pre-market session for these two, you couldn't be talking with, by more than two different verging fortunes here. You have Netflix gaining, what, some 14 percent Tesla. It's down nearly 5 percent in the pre-market. Yeah, I mean, I think Netflix have managed to put up the prices. You didn't even notice the price going up, did you? Your purse is so <laughs> full of cash and swag. You just didn't uh, even notice yeah, that sure. they put it up by a buck. <laughs> I've noticed it went from $2 to $3. Uh, you see, I, I'm, more, I'm not as immune to pricing as you, Ms. Berger. That's it for the proof. <laughs> Surveillance is up next. Good morning from New York and London.